everyone. Uh, I'm Gagik and I work at SFL. And uh, recently, uh, we've been challenged to create uh, component libraries for two different projects, totally independent, but they both required some amount of uh, UI logic or UI components be shared between like different projects. So uh, we put some effort, we put some resources and time into making this happen. It was totally new to us. And um, I'll, in the next slides, I'll try to share my experience on how it ended up being for us. And still is a, uh, obviously a work in progress. So, um, all right, so uh, before we st start talking all technical, let's first understand what exactly is a design system because uh, we as front-end developers are directly impacted by the uh, designs we are provided. And of course, we don't understand uh, how they were made, actually. We cannot uh, make good assumptions and make good calls about uh, how to structure our code base, right? And um, so design system is uh, basically, from designer's perspective, is a place where they put all of, the, uh, all of their uh, UI logic and also behavior logic and et cetera. Before, but before that, let's uh, talk a little bit history. So when I started doing uh, web development, it was around 2008, maybe. And um, the designs we were provided were basically pages. So the designer would go to you and say, here's a page, Pre please assemble it into HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we would normally do it. Uh, and uh, it was actually creating a lot of problems for us because um, both as front-end developers and for, as, uh, for designers as well, because it's hard to work on the designs when you're thinking with pages because a page is a, like, it's not a small unit, it's a big unit. And uh, so usually what would they do is uh, when creating a new page, they would copy over an existing page, uh, the page that had the component that they needed, and they would just copy the component from this page's design uh, to the next page's design and uh, would most probably in a not ideal world, they would uh, change a pixel or change a shadow or change some margins. And when it happens, bam, you already have created a new component because you have changed the original one in a way it was not designed to be changed. So as you can see, as a result of that, consistency was flow because um, you are creating maybe 10 different versions of the same component. And the uh, obvious disadvantage is that, of course, we then, as developers, create the same 10 versions of the component ourselves in our code base, which you can assume that it's uh, like really hard to maintain. Um, and um, for that uh, not to happen, uh, they um, started thinking in... Uh, designs, uh, design systems. I think it all started, maybe I'm mistaken because I'm not a designer, but maybe it all started uh, by Brett Foster who implemented, uh, who first thought about atomic design. And it's a, like a huge topic and design systems itself is a huge topic. And I, I cannot really get too much deep into it, but the design system like kind of for designers solved the problem of having two big units to interact with. Uh, so of course, we as front-end developers needed to catch up with that. And what we did, we uh, created component libraries. And what I'm about to say is a mind-blowing, but a component library is a library of components. And um, so let's see uh, what it brings to the table uh, when we start investing or when we start doing or when we start thinking about uh, implementing a uh, component library for ourselves. By the way, if I say component library, UI library, or uh, component guide, those are all interchangeable and mean basically the same thing. So uh, one obvious reason on, you might say like, well, now I have my components in my source, base, uh, source code in my project. So I have source, components, and here they all are, like 100 components. And why would I invest time and 
um, make everything harder for myself to create a component library and um, uh, if, if, I, if I'm fine doing what I'm doing right now, and do, and, I mean, it's fine, right? Why would I ever want to think about it? And one obvious reason for pitching the uh, component library, obviously, is when you have one project and uh, many apps. For example, it might be a uh, front-facing application, user-facing one, and then it might be an administration interface, it might be an AMP or... Um, and non-AMP versions of the same site, if you know what AMP is. Um, I w we had that uh, exact problem uh, when we were developing our uh, project. So one obvious reason is that, is that we reduce development time by not repeating what we have already done. Uh, we increase collaboration because uh, two different teams who are working on two different apps of the same project can now collaboratively create the UI library and then share it with each other and uh, maybe fix bugs or add features when they are needed. And uh, last thing is obviously the UIs are more consistent because we're using the same uh, code. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, um, it does not mean that the UI library cannot be of any help if you're doing uh, one project, one application. Because what happens uh, often is that we as developers might put too much responsibility into a single component, which is very common. I know we are cool and we don't do it, we do everything right all the time, ever, but some people don't and some people uh, like create a component that has business responsibility and then create a component which, which has a UI responsibility, which is kind of stupid, but then uh, not separating the concerns correctly, the business functionality overflows and um, spills into the uh, UI component. And uh, if, for example, a tooltip, right? A tooltip might in one place, besides being, well, a tooltip, in one place might require the text to be cut down and in another uh, version that comes later, it might not. So if we just implement the cutting text logic inside our tooltip, then when we uh, encounter the next usage example, we are going to do a lot of refactoring, going back and forward, introducing a lot of bugs. But when we think about individual and independent uh, components, it's easy to reason about uh, what gets and what does not uh, get into the component. And uh, also one uh, important question needs to be addressed. So what we do when our projects don't, have, don't match looks? And if you're, I don't know, an outsourcing company or a freelancer, uh, most of your projects usually don't. They have different designs. The buttons, inputs, and the page layouts are totally different. So does it mean that the UI library is useless in that scenario? Well, actually, uh, your library, your projects still share functionality because our apps do not uh, uh, only, are not only made of uh, components that have actually colors and have some sort of UI appearance, but also they're made of uh, building blocks uh, that don't have any UI, but they're only functionalities like a model at the same, maybe tooltips can also be considered if implemented correctly. Uh, might be notification trays, might be uh, grids, typography, any kind of toggler or switcher, and etc. That means that uh, we still can benefit if we move uh, that kind of, uh, if we create a library of these components and share it with between the projects. And uh, because, yeah, well, I'm not going to spoil it, just a sec. Uh, why is the next slide in here? Because I was told that uh, any good presentation should have a joke in it, and I didn't know how to squeeze it in my presentation, so just uh, here is a joke. And while you enjoy it, I will just uh, take a sip of water. Yeah, black humor, for those of you who get it. Um, all right, so now that this is out of the way, let's talk about 
implementing actually a component library. And we, in the company where I work, were really, like really badly wanted to have one. Why? Because we have the situation both when we have one project, different apps, but we also have many different apps that don't share um, uh, any UI. But our designers, our designers somehow managed to um, create a centralized workflow and benefit from sharing some design units with each other. So we thought, why don't we do the same thing? Because it's cool and can uh, bring a lot of benefit. And a full disclaimer, I am not going to touch upon all the aspects of creating all the parts of UI component, but just to give you a head start, or give you a good, maybe good reference point from which you can take on and continue and get uh, uh, deeper and more proficient with uh, creating uh, libraries. But here's what, we're, what we, our expectations were and still are when we first started thinking about creating UI libraries. So we obviously wanted it to be centralized and version controlled. So when a new version breaks, we go back uh, maybe or upgrade when a bug is fixed. No need to explain farther, I think. Uh, we want it to be modular. And um, of course, I will go deeper into uh, what all of this means. But modular is basically means that we don't want to bundle all the UI library when we just need one component, which makes sense because uh, for a long time, like Lodash and other huge libraries that we depended on, uh, you, when you import just one function from the library, it got bundled all together. And your best bet is that Webpack is smart about tree shaking, but you cannot really rely on that. Uh, so we want, to, uh, we want our component library to be modular by design, not to leave it to the tooling. Also, we want it to feel native. We'll get back to that later. We want to have it. Uh, we want it to have lean style adjustments, so I can take a uh, input component which is already implemented, adjust some styles, and use it just as well, and not need to implement it from scratch. And uh, to be as granular as possible, not to have like big component who is a pile of a lot of code and just does one thing and does it good, but instead uh, to split, uh, split it up into different components who interact with each other and create uh, this or that component. Uh, with the basic project setup, so setting the UI library is just plain simple. It doesn't have to be any complicated. So what you do is you add your package JSON with the name, version, or whatever goes in there. You add your ESLint configuration because none of us wants to have a, I don't know, a dirty code. And uh, also one tip, uh, it now also supports TypeScript because the TypeScript TSLint development team um, announced that they want to join forces with ESLint. So you, have, you can have both regardless of you're doing plain JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, we want to have browser list and this is important because a browser list is, uh, I was surprised when I actually learned deeply about it. You can define your list of support browsers in one place and then have not only Bubble, which traditionally we think of Bubble when we uh, think about browser list, but also other component, other uh, libraries and tools can also make use of this and then you will have a unified uh, browser's target list instead of having them defined in different uh, tool specific configurations. Uh, obviously, we will need Babel because we don't want uh, our users, the users of the library, to be transpiling the code because usually what we do is uh, we ignore the node modules, right? Uh, we don't want them to have to change that. So we pre-compile our code for them. But that does not mean that we need a Webpack. Well, do we do not need as a stretch, but we might not need it because, as I said, if our component libraries uh, modular, it means you can put individual components into your dependency tree and not like the full library with it, all of its uh, modules. And uh, in the next slides, we're going to just go uh, over a few simple tips on how to avoid common mistakes. And uh, many of them I've learned from the community and did not come up by myself, but I did a little bit. Um, 
Let's take an example, as an example, one simple component, a button. What's wrong about that, right? So we have a button, whatever you put in, in the component, inside the component gets transferred uh, or transcluded, as old developers might uh, think of that, um, into the, uh, between the tags of the button. But that's not good. And we, uh, before we talked about the native fill, because we uh, traditionally used uh, buttons or any other HTML element given that or having that this is a given so we can bind on clicks or any other event listeners we can bind classes we can bind styles we can bind area labels it comes natural to us so why can't our component also uh, have it and to enable it is very simple what we have to do is just um, decompose children from the rest of the probes and then bind the rest of the probes uh, inside the button. So now when uh, you use this component and add any type of properties to it, they just naturally get proxied inside uh, the component. Um, so usually we have different types of buttons or different types of anything. It can be also input, uh, like email input, number input, they, all of all are inputs and we could write everywhere button variant primary to get primary buttons all over the place but instead we can uh, create a wrapper component that just hard codes it in there and avoids repetition also we need to uh, be careful about the api that we are providing to our users because uh, it's don't not not need there is no need to cre recreate apis because html has for years been doing that and what we could do to help our users is to kind of make use of that the API that they're they, they already familiar with um, that means that avatar component which we all assume is an image can have instead of a pot which is true because it's the pot of the image but we used to call it a source for years so why not just uh, make use of it and why not stop there? Let's let's uh, support all of the uh, attributes that the image tag supported for years, and make our users happy. Um, what if we think about this notification? How would we implement it? We see clearly that there is an icon and there is a message, and uh, we could just uh, go with this to uh, provide the type of the icon and the notification component does rest for itself. But it has one drawback. That means that the icon component that puts the SVG or icon font in there needs to be inside the dependency of a notification, which is bad. We don't want that to happen because I might use notification without a button. So what we can do instead, we can um, cut that part from notifications functionality and just provide the icon component instead of the name of the icon uh, and reduce the dependencies of the notification component. Also, we need to understand how, uh, well, my uh, image is not loaded. Well, this on the left is uh, a tooltip. Just trust me on this. Um, what we could do is create one huge tooltip component that does everything. When you hover, it positions the content and then it's content itself. But what we could do is split it into two different components and have like popover, which handles the ho hovering, uh, handling, and then uh, positioning, and then have a tooltip itself, which is like a stupid uh, bunch of pixels. And then, which means that if we have a date component, like the nice component where you press it and then the calendar pops up, can also make use of the popover component. So it's a win. Um, also, I, I knew that I will not manage to, think, uh, to talk about styling the, of the components in depth, but this is a huge topic, but I kind of predicted it. And, um, and just um, to quickly go over it, how we approached it, and this is super experimental, but uh, uh, we, it's, it's obvious CSS modules, which means that we are kind of doing a bad job because we make uh, our component library tool dependent because we need the Webpack or any other tool that understands modules that end with CSS because natively we don't have any modules named CSS. But um, we know that it brings scopes. If you don't know it, uh, go read about uh, 
CSS modules is really cool. But what we did, what we added on top is um, custom properties. And they are now mostly supported, like 80 something percent of the browser support uh, uh, those uh, custom properties. And which means that if our uh, components are styled this way, we can easily change them or uh, provide themes for them uh, on the fly, like in, on the run time of the browser and just customize them how we want. Uh, also, yeah, not also, but that's it from the styling. Of course, there are CSS and JS solutions, but as I said, I'm not going to go too much deep into this because it's a huge topic by itself and there are a lot of debates about uh, pure CSS versus CSS and JS, uh, whatever. And we need to, of course, understand the disadvantage because if I'm, not, if I'm creating a landing page, uh, I might not necessarily need a UI library, but it's, it's, it will be a little bit an overkill uh, and will just I will be killing a lot of time for nothing. To go farther from here, as I said, it's a, just a head start for you to start your um, uh, libraries or uh, advance them, or maybe you have done something I didn't do, and I would like to hear your opinions and experiences over maybe a coffee. But um, some tips. So I suggest you go read about preset env, which, because it's the babble of the CSS. It's really cool. It does everything the bubble does for CSS, plus more. And the post CSS itself is like a really cool concept. CSS, G, G, CSS in GS solutions, there are like maybe a dozen of libraries already uh, up there doing CSS in GS in many different ways. Uh, of course, uh, uh, obviously, we have Storybook because we need to somehow present our um, library for uh, independently from the project uh, to see what's available. And uh, we also, I suggest you to go read uh, and look at the codes of Material UI and because those folks are really clever and they do really clever stuff. Um, for example, Material UI used to do plain CSS, then they changed to SAS, and then changed to CSS and GS solutions, and now fourth version is coming up with, I don't know what is going to be there, but it's always good to have it as a reference and to read and to learn from the um, cool guys that are doing these awesome libraries. And uh, actually, that's it for me. I don't have a question slide, but that doesn't mean your questions are not welcome, if you have any. Yes, please. When we should uh, use uh, standard component libraries such as Material UI, and when we should create own component libraries? Okay, when we should use uh, already made libraries like Material UI, and uh, when create one of our own? Well, it basically depends on the project. If I'm doing really quick administration portal, I will definitely not create one for myself, but just take Material UI create tables, inputs, forms, everything is there, right? And if I feel like I can do minor customizations to already existing material UI and still be fine with that, I will also do that. But when there, the UI is really, really different, then you get into trouble because you, the, the way you change the pre presentation of material UI is really complicated and it the results in really ugly code because you inline a lot of styles and we are naturally told uh, never to inline styles in uh, our HTML, right? And the same applies here. So I would say if it's a large scale project with its unique design, go ahead and create your uh, UI library if it's big enough, right? Any more questions? No, then thank you. <laughs>